Now the Ephraimites asked Gideon, Why have you treated us like this? Why don't you call us when we went to fight Midian? And they challenged him vigorously, but he answered them, What have I accomplished compared to you? Aren't the gleaning of Ephraim's grapes better than the full harvest grape um, of Ebenezer? God gave Oreb and Zeb, the Midianite leaders, into your hands. What was I able to do compared to you? At this, their resentment against him subsided. Gideon and his 300 men, exhausted yet keeping up the pursuit, came to the Jordan and crossed it. He said to the men of Succoth, Give my troops some bread. They are worn out. And I am still pursuing Zeba and Zalmulna, the kings of Midian. But the officials of Succoth said, Do you already have the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna in your possession? Why should we give bread to your troops? Then Gideon replied, Just for that, when the Lord has given Zeba and Zalmunna into my hand, I will tear your flesh with desert thorns and briars. From there, he went up to Peniel and made the same request of them. But they answered as the men of Succoth had. So he said to the men of Peniel, When I return in triumph, I will tear down this tower. Now Zeba and Zalmunna were in Karkor with a force of about 15,000 men all that were left of the, of the armies of the Eastern peoples. 120,000 swordsmen had fallen. Gideon went up by the route of the nomads east of Nerba and Jogbaha and attacked the unsuspecting army. Zeba and Zalmunna, the two kings of Midian, fled, but he pursued them and captured them, routing their entire army. Gideon, son of Joash, then returned from the battle by the pass of Herez. He caught a young man of Succoth and questioned him. And the young man wrote down for him the names of the 77 officials of, the, of Succoth, the elders of the town. Then Gideon came and said to the men of Succoth, Here are Zeba and Zalmunna, about whom you taunted me, saying, Do you already have the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna in your possession? Why should we give bread to your exhausted men? He took the elders of the town and taught the men of Succoth a lesson by punishing them with desert thorns and briars. He also pulled down the tower of Peniel and killed the men of the town. Then he asked Zeba and Zalmunna, What kind of men did you kill at Tabor? Men like you, each one with the burden of a prince. Gideon replied, those were my brothers, the sons of my own mother. As surely as the Lord lives, if you had spared their lives, I would not kill you. Turning to Jetha, his oldest son, he said, Kill them. But Jetha did not draw his sword, because he was only a boy and was afraid. Zeba and Zalmunna said, Come, do it yourself. As is the man, so is his strength. So Gideon stepped forward and killed them and took the ornaments off their camel's necks. The Israelites said to Gideon, Rule over us, you, your son and your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. I do have one request that each of you give me an earring from your share of the plunder. It was the custom of the Ishmaelites to wear gold earrings. They answered, We'll be glad to give them. So they spread out a garment, and each of them threw a ring from his plunder onto it. The weight of the gold rings he asked for came to 1,700 shekels, not counting the ornaments, the pendants, and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian, all the chains that were on their camels' necks. Gideon made the gold into an ephod, which he placed in Ophrah, his town. All Israel prostituted themselves by worshipping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. 
Thus Midian was subdued before the Israelites and did not raise its head again. During Gideon's lifetime, the land had peace for 40 years. Jeroboam, son of Joash, went back home to live. He had 70 sons of his own, for he had many wives. His concubine, who lived in Shechem, also bore him a son, whom he named Abimelech. Gideon, son of Joash, died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of his father Joash in Ophrah of the Abizarites. No sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals. They set up Baal Berith as their god and did not remember the Lord their God who had rescued them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. They also failed to show any loyalty to the family of Jeroboam, that is Gideon, in spite of all the good things he had done for them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading continues from the first in Judges chapter 9. Judges chapter 9. Abimelech, son of Jeroboam, went to his mother's brothers in Shechem and said to them, and to all his mother's clan, Ask all the citizens of Shechem, which is better for you, to have all seventy of Jeroboam's sons rule over you, or just one man? Remember, I am your flesh and blood. When the brothers repeated all this to the citizens of Shechem, they were inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, He is related to us. They gave him 70 shekels of silver from the temple of Barbereth, and Abimelech used it to hire reckless scoundrels who became his followers. He went to his father's home in Ophrah and on one stone murdered his 70 brothers, the sons of Jeroboam. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam, escaped by hiding. Then all the citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo gathered beside the great tree at the pillar in Shechem to crown Abimelech king. When Jotham was told about this, he climbed up on the top of Mount Gerizim and shouted to them, Listen to me, citizens of Shechem, so that God may listen to you. One day, the trees went out to anoint a king for themselves. They said to the olive tree, Be our king. But the olive tree answered, Should I give up my oil, by which both gods and humans are honoured, to hold sway over the trees? Next, the tree said to the fig tree, Come and be our king. But the fig tree replied, Should I give up my fruit so good and sweet to hold sway over the trees? Then the tree said to the vine, Come and be our king. But the vine answered, Should I give up my wine, which cheers both gods and humans, to hold sway over the trees? Finally, the trees said to the thorn bush, Come and be our king. The thorn bush said to the trees, if you really want to anoint me king over you, come and take refuge in my shade. But if not, then let fire come out of the thorn bush and consume the cedars of Lebanon. Have you acted honorably and in good faith by making Abimelech king? Have you been fair to Jeroboam and his family? Have you treated him as he deserves? Remember that my father fought for you and risked his life to rescue you from the hand of Midian. But today you have revolted against my father's family. You have murdered his 70 sons on a single stone and have made Abimelech, the son of his female slave, king over the citizens of Shechem because he's related to you. So have you acted honorably and in good faith toward Jeroboam and his family today? If you have, may Abimelech be your joy and may you be his too. But if you have not, let fire come out from Abimelech and consume you, the citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo. And let fire come out from you, the citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo, and consume Abimelech. Then Jotham fled, escaping to Beer, and he lived there because he was afraid of his brother Abimelech. After Abimelech had governed Israel three years, God stirred up animosity between Abimelech and the citizens of Shechem so that they acted treacherously against Abimelech. God did this in order that the crime against Jeroboam's 70 sons, the shedding of their blood, might be avenged on their brother Abimelech and on the citizens of Shechem, who had helped him murder his brothers. 
In opposition to him, these citizens of Shechem set men on the hilltops to ambush and rob everyone who passed by. And this was reported to Abimelech. Now Gal, son of Ebed, moved with his clan into Shechem, and its citizens put their confidence in him. After they'd gone out into the fields and gathered the grapes and trodden them, they held a festival in the temple of their god. While they were eating and drinking, they cursed Abimelech. Then Gal, son of Ebed, said, Who is Abimelech, and why should we Shechemites be subject to him? Isn't he Jerobal's son, and isn't Zebul his deputy? Serve the family of Hamor, Shechem's father. Why should we serve Abimelech? If only this people were under my command, then I'd get rid of him. I'd say to Abimelech, call out your whole army. When Zebul, the governor of the city, heard what Gal, son of Ebed, said, he was very angry. Under cover, he sent messengers to Abimelech, saying, Gal, son of Ebed, and his clan have come to Shechem and are stirring up the city against you. Now then, during the night, you and your men should come and lie in wait in the fields. In the morning at sunrise, advance against the city. When Gal and his men come out against you, seize the opportunity to attack them. So Abimelech and all his troops set out by night and took up concealed positions near Shechem in four companies. Now Gal, son of Ebed, had gone out and was standing at the entrance of the city gate, just as Abimelech and his troops came out from their hiding place. When Gal saw them, he said to Zebul, Look, people are coming down from the tops of the mountains. Zebul replied, You mistake the shadows of the mountains for men. But Gal spoke up again. Look, people are coming down from the central hill, and a company is coming from the direction of the diviner's tree. Then Zebul said to him, Where is your big talk now? You who said, Who is Abimelech, that we should be subject to him? Aren't these the men you ridiculed? Go out and fight them. So Gal led out the citizens of Shechem and fought Abimelech. Abimelech chased him all the way to the entrance of the gate, and many were killed as they fled. Then Abimelech stayed at Arumah, and Zebul drove Gal and his clan out of Shechem. The next day the people of Shechem went out to the fields, and this was reported to Abimelech. So he took his men, divided them into three companies, and set an ambush in the fields. When he saw the people coming out of the city, he rose to attack them. Abimelech and the companies with him rushed forward to a position at the entrance of the city gate. Then two companies attacked those in the fields and struck them down. All that day, Abimelech pressed his attack against the city until he had captured it and killed its people. Then he destroyed the city and scattered salt over it. On hearing this, the citizens in the Tower of Shechem went into the stronghold of the temple of El Birith. When Abimelech heard that they had assembled there, he and all his men went up Mount Zalmon. He took an axe and cut off some branches, which he lifted to his shoulders. He ordered the men with him, Quick, do what you have seen me do. So all the men cut branches and followed Abimelech. They piled them against the stronghold and set it on fire with the people still inside. So all the people in the Tower of Shechem, about a thousand men and women, also died. Next, Abimelech went to Thebes and besieged it and captured it. Inside the city, however, was a strong tower to which all the men and women, all the people of the city, had fled. They had locked themselves in and climbed up on the tower roof. Abimelech went to the tower and attacked it. But as he approached the entrance to the tower to set it on fire, a woman dropped an upper millstone on his head and cracked his skull. Hurriedly, he called to his armour-bearer, Draw your sword and kill me, so they can't say a woman killed him. So his servant ran him through and he died. Then the Israelites saw that Abimelech was dead. They went home. Thus God repaid the wickedness that Abimelech had done to his father by murdering his 70 brothers. God also made the people of Shechem pay for all their wickedness. The curse of Jotham, son of Jeroboam, came on them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh Lord, our God, we praise you that the wounds of our Lord Jesus Christ have indeed paid our ransom, the one who came not to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. We praise you that in your goodness and mercy, according to your sovereign will, you have chosen us to be part of that many. 
And as we come to your word now, your holy, inspired word, the rule and guide for your people, speak to us, Lord. Speak to us so that we hear your voice. Speak to us, Lord, so that we're filled with hope. <coughs> Speak to us, Lord, to create within us reverent fear. Speak to us that we might know you and know our own hearts. And in so doing, long to glorify you. By the power of your spirit, speak to us, Lord. Amen. And please do and be seated and do turn in your Bibles to Judges 8 and 9. It is wonderful how much um, these narratives have to teach us, even though I'm often maybe unfamiliar or sometimes just getting your head around the actual story, what's um, going on, and then obviously making that transition um, to think about what it means for us now, um, the church. Now, you'll be aware, obviously, from the week past, um, that there's going to be a general election. Um, Whoopie-doo. So we um, get to choose um, the next um, party that will be leading the country, who's going to govern us. Um, but when it gets uh, mentioned, you get different reactions, but some people get very anxious and that they might make the wrong choice. An election's coming up, we're going to make a choice, these people are going to rule us, govern us for four years, and they get very anxious not wanting to make the wrong choice. Now, this evening, I'm going to um, take away much of that anxiety and fear for you, because I'm going to assure you that the ballot paper is going to be filled with wrong choices. Okay, in fact, the general election this year will be a case, in my opinion, of choose your poison. Okay, the, the leadership and political leadership of this country is at a low ebb. I think we can um, agree on that. It's hard to um, ask what anybody, uh, any party has accomplished um, of late. But before we fall into a pit of despair about that, um, let me um, give you some um, hope. And the hope comes from this. Glance over the pond and remember things could be a lot worse. <laughs> you see, uh, last week uh, we saw that God um, chose a ruler named Gideon. And then God had a strategy, um, a campaign strategy for um, um, choosing of Gideon, didn't he? And for the people. He wanted to reduce the fighting men from 32,000 um, to 300, Richard reminded us, I think he said it was 450 um, to 1. And why did the Lord do that in the choosing of this ruler and as a, um, a campaign strategy? Well, verse, chapter 7, verse 2 tells us, The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel will burst against me. My own strength has saved me. So it must be clear to the people um, that it's the Lord who's delivered the people, the Lord who's saved them, not um, Gideon and his army. But although we don't have um, time to go into great detail, it becomes very apparent in chapter 8 that Gideon starts acting as, this, as, this, as if this is his own personal campaign. Uh, in verses 6 and um, 7, um, and in verse 18 to 19, we see that it very much becomes about Gideon and how he's going to relate to the different in individuals and how they relate to him. So it comes as no surprise that the Israelites then ask Gideon to rule over them because quite frankly, um, Gideon has been hinting at that, acting in a way that makes it look like that's uh, what he's after. Gideon's actions have brought about the very thing that God was concerned to avoid. They seem to think that Gideon, um, not the Lord, was the one who was acting to save um, and to rescue. And so it becomes natural um, for the people to say, well, Gideon, why don't you rule over us um, as king? And that's where the people make completely the wrong choice, part one, um, verses 22 um, to 35. Look at verse 22. The Israelites said to Gideon, rule over us, you, your son, and your grandson, because you have saved us from the hands of Midian. Now, this is an offer of kingship. Now, you might say, oh, well, what does it matter if they say you, your sons, and your grandsons? 
But remember, up until this point, the Lord is their king, he's their ruler, and he raises up judges at the appointed time for a specific reason, to save his people so that they will know that the Lord who is king rules over them and acts to save them. But of course, as soon as you say, actually, Gideon, you, and then your son and your grandson, what has been offered there is hereditary rule. What the people are saying is, now we want a monarchy. We want a kingship, where it's not God raising up one individual for a task, for a purpose, because God is king, but actually we'll take you and whatever son you have, and then whatever son they have, and they can be the king, therefore supplanting God as a supreme king and ruler over the people. Now this is completely and utterly the wrong choice. In making that request, they're rejecting God's rule and rescue of them. Now Gideon recognizes what the request is, and he rejects it, doesn't he? Isn't it interesting? He gives them a mild rebuke. Verse 23, but Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. So it's a big hooray for Gideon. Well done, um, Gideon. Okay, this is precisely what God wanted for you. They have made this offer of kingship, and now you have rejected that offer of kingship. And his reply gets to the heart of the issue, who the Israelites want to rule over them, and also who would want to rule over them. If you think about it, it's a very strange request, isn't it, to ask Gideon to rule over them. What kind of king would um, Gideon be? Well, let's think what evidence we've seen. Verses 1 to 3, he answers Ephraim with diplomacy, averting an infight. It's very political, isn't it? Diplomatic. They come out, they've got a gripe against him, and he says, oh, what am I compared to you? Oh, don't think anything of me. You're great, I'm not. Very diplomatic. Oh, well, that would be good from a ruler and a king, wouldn't it? Somebody who's diplomatic. But then, <laughs> he's ruthless with Sukkoth and Peniel because they wavered, just like he'd wavered in the beginning, but just Gideon was shown mercy, but he shows no mercy to these people. One moment is diplomatic with the people of Ephraim. The next moment is absolutely ruthless with the people of Sukkoth and Peniel. But also, who would want to be king of these people? See, what kind of people are there? Well, what does the evidence say? Ephraim was annoyed that Gideon hadn't called them out earlier, so they complain and criticize. Sukkoth and Peniel are annoyed that he called them out too soon, so they complain and criticize. So get this, you've got Gideon there, and you've got one group of people, and they go, oh, I can't believe you, oh, you called us out too late, what kind of ruler are you, you should have called us out earlier. And then go down the road to another group of people, and they're saying, oh, you called us out too soon, can't believe that you wanted us to get into the battle at this point. The people are complaining and criticizing. Now, it's really interesting. Both of them, and both of these groups, are not very loyal subjects, not the royal, loyal subjects you'd want them to be. Ethraim is all about status, aren't they? They wanted to be part of the battle. They wanted to be called out so they could get the glory. And they're saying, oh, Gideon, why didn't you call us out? We could have shared in the glory of this battle. They're about status. And then Sukkoth and Peniel, they're saying, look, you wanted to call us out too soon, and we didn't even know which way the battle was going to go. They're concerned about their security. But neither of the people are concerned about loyalty or service. Both are stumbling blocks to trusting the Lord and seeking his honor. So who would want to be king over these people? And of course, that forces, the narrative forces us to ask a question of ourselves. What kind of subject are you? Are we like the men of Ephraim? Well, all we want is the status. The status that goes with the Lord's cause, whatever it might be, but we're looking for the status. Why didn't you give me that job? Why didn't you allow me to do that? Why can't I read? Why can't I be in the band? Why can't I serve in um, that group? Why can't I lead this or lead that? We just care about status. Give me the status. Give me the um, position. 
But what about the men of Sikkim? Are we like them? That we won't get involved until there's guaranteed security because we don't want any risk. We want to see that it's already been delivered over. It's already been um, successful. You know, I'll go join Christchurch Hazel when there's 150 of them and it's all stable and it's all going well and there's plenty uh, of people around. That's when I'll join. But I don't want to be part of the first 30. That's a bit risky. So what kind of subjects are we? Are we those subjects who are just looking for status? Well, I'll get involved if it's going to um, lift me up, if it's going to uh, exalt me in some way. Are we those um, subjects who were just looking for security. Okay, if it's, a, if it's a done deal, and you can guarantee me that it's not going to cost me, there's not going to be any risk towards me in serving the kingdom. Or all with those subjects who just say, no, I'm open to be used and by and the king. Will you step out on the Lord's cause when he calls for the purpose that he calls you to? Or do you just say, well, no, I want status or security, but not service. And what's Gideon's response to this um, offer um, of kingship? <clears throat> well, a good response on paper, isn't it? Verbally, he rejects kingship, and then practically, he starts to flirt with it, verse 24. Verbally, he says, no, I will not rule over you. My son will not rule over you. The Lord rules over you. So he refuses the position of um, honor. He says that belongs to God alone. But then look what he does. He starts to assume kingly privileges. He asks for financial reward, a tribute from all the people, and becomes, therefore, a very rich man. Who does that? Kings. They say, give me part of the plunder. He acquires many wives and a concubine. Who does that? Kings. He sets up a victory idol, reminiscent of Exodus 32 in verse 27. Sets up this um, thing um, that people are to come to. Let's, let's talk about that, this um, ephod um, that we um, read about. It's worn by the high priest, those at New Orleans, We looked at this in Leviticus. It's there um, by the high priest at the tabernacle. Uh, the tent of meeting, um, God was present, shared his presence with his people. At this point, it's located and sited at Shiloh. So Gideon is essentially setting up his hometown as a rival place of worship. So they say, you rule over us. And he says, no, I'm not going to rule over you. God will rule over you. But if you don't mind, give me a share of your plunder, offer a tribute. I'm going to have many um, wives. And also, now can you come to this place to worship? Where my family are. And we'll be the one who administer every aspect of the life um, of Israel. He wants to encourage the people to come to him for guidance, to see his hometown as a hotspot for religious activity. So what lessons are we um, to learn as God's people um, from um, Gideon? Well, firstly, Gideon used God to secure his own position instead of using his position to serve God and to serve Israel. And this is a trap that so many people can um, fall into. We're reading a book as a staff team called Lead, and um, it talks about different, how you create the right culture, the right leadership um, culture for churches, the different problems you can um, face. And as we were sharing um, in this group, and um, we're talking about the, the different temptations uh, of us, and they said, what is the biggest temptation um, for me and I shared personally? Um, that it's, it's pride. Um, pride, because when everything is going well, when everybody speaks well of you, uh, and you say it's all for the Lord and it's all for the Lord, well, when it's small or when it seems insignificant or uh, when there's troubles and there's difficulties, it's easy to say it's for the Lord because you don't particularly want to put your name to it. But how often do leaders fall, and we see it across the church that leaders fall, not because the church is unsuccessful, but because that particular church has become very successful. Well thought of in the city, large in number, many activities, attracting people. And suddenly, 
Um, the leader who once used his position in order to serve God and to serve the people suddenly starts to use their position to get the people to serve them and to exalt them. So do you use what the Lord has given you to lift his name high or to magnify your own name? Because that's what the character of Gideon presents us with. But secondly, Gideon shows us how hypocritical it is when our public pronouncements don't match our private practice. He said all the right words from his mouth, didn't he? I will not rule over you. My son will not rule over you. Everything that came out of his mouth was right. A wonderful public pronouncement. And then his practice was, well, just give us a bit of your gold and make sure you keep coming to my home um, town um, to offer um, worship. And also allow me to take many um, wives and have many children. Loyal subjects don't just mouth the right words, but they live lives that are consistent with those words. And this is a strong warning for us as God's people. Any one of us, does the Lord look down and see his people using his gifts, the gifts that he's given them to bring glory and honor to his name? Does the Lord look down and see people honoring him with their lips, but their hearts are far from him? You remember that's Jesus' criticism of the religious leaders in his day. Jesus comes along to the religious leaders and time and time again, he declares that they're hypocrites. Why? Because they honor me with my, their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And we need to ask um, the question, it's a question that Christians should ask themselves all the time, daily. Am I just honoring God with my lips, with the words of my mouth, but my heart is actually far um, from him? Well, choose your poison. So we now turn to completely the wrong choice, part two. And this is chapter um, nine, verses one to 55. If things were on a downward spiral when they offered Gideon kingship, well, what would it be like if you find an individual who actively pursues kingship? Enter Abimelech, Gideon's son by his concubine who lived in Shechem. So Gideon rejected kingship, remember, in name, but started to act like a king. Abimelech actively seeks to be king and will do everything in his power to make himself um, king. Abimelech craves and grasps after power for himself. He goes um, to his own relatives and he, has a, he says, look, I've got a straightforward argument for you. It's better that you have one person ruling over you um, than 70 people. And now the best case scenario is if that one ruler comes from the line of Gideon because he's the person who's just um, been used by God to rescue the people. And what if he not only came from Gideon, but it also was related to you people as well? Do the math, I'm your man. <laughs> and isn't that always the argument of any kind of leaders that want to us to succumb to them? I'm connected to you. Um, I'm one of you. I'll fight your cause. Uh, you'll see that, that recently just because uh, they always come out these videos when people are in the election of uh, Rishi Sunak and they say to him, um, can you relate to everybody? Uh, I don't know if you've seen it. It's very funny. And he says, I've got friends from all walks of life, upper class, middle class, working class. No, not the working class. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really funny um, video where he just gets caught, shoots himself off guard, just being honest. But no, he hasn't got... But that's what we want to say, don't they? They're one of us. Oh, one of the people that can connect with us. I'm one of your own. And I'll fight uh, for your cause. And the men of Shechem, they swallow it hook, line, and sinker. They fund his campaign with money from the temple of Baal Bereth. Proving that old saying to be true, blood is thicker than brains. You see, Abimelech's rise to power is facilitated not by the Lord. Remember, throughout Judges, the Lord has been raising up Judges. 
But Abimelech's rise to power is funded not by the Lord, but by funds from a false god's um, shrine. And it will be founded on the blood of his murdered half-brothers, verse 5. And so the deterioration is absolutely shocking. Gideon killed fellow Israelites. Now Abimelech murders his own family. So if you think about it, when God chooses the leader, he runs the campaign, he says what it to be. It still has so many issues because of the loyalty of the people. But when a person pushes themselves forward, well, it's disastrous. And so Jotham, who escapes this slaughter of all these um, half-brothers of Abimelech, he escapes and he tells a parable about kingship in verses 7 to 21. So you can just imagine it. It's the best day for Abimelech. It's his coronation. Um, he's killed all his brothers. It just seems like plain sailing. And then he hears a voice from the mountain. It's Jotham um, crying out uh, while Abimelech, um, like uh, you, saw, you saw when... Um, and uh, Rishi Shunak did the announcement. Did you hear that on the news? He was doing the announcement. There's going to be a de- general election. And when someone was playing on a loudspeaker, things can only get better um, from the days of Tony Blair. It's like this nightmare situation for Rishi Sunak. It's even worse for Abimelech. Here he is, coronation day. Jotham, somebody who's escaped, starts shouting um, from this Mount Gerizim that was supposed to be the Mount of Blessing. And he starts shouting out um, to the people. And Abimelech means my father is king. Jotham means Yahweh is perfect. And so Jotham calls the men of Shechem to this contest, a contest for their hearts. And he's saying to them, who do you want to rule over you? The ruthless, merciless Abimelech or the merciful, faithful, blameless Lord? And he does this um, story, a parable about trees. And in essence, this parable, do you, I hope when you read it, it just puts across the idea of the ridiculous nature of choosing Abimelech to be your king. What the parable basically says is, look, you've had some really useful people who if you had made them king, they probably could have done something for you. Okay. But none of those were made king. Now you've got this thorn bush that produces neither oil or fruit It's not large enough to even um, shade under. And why would you choose to take refuge under it? Because you just end up with a thorn in your side for the rest of your life. And but Jotham Jotham says, like, you're so brainless because he's a blood relative that you'll choose him um, to be your king. Jotham says, he says, look, this is what he essentially says. He says, look, if you've been fair to Gideon's family and making Abimelech your king. And let's face it, you haven't. But if you had, may you find great blessing under his rule. But if you haven't, and let's face it, I think the bodies on the stones show that you haven't, then I hope you get what you deserve. You burned by him, and he burned and by you. And what follows in the narrative is um, certainly constitutes getting burned, a raging fire in the reality of Abimelech's kingship. Shechem switches its loyalty, verse 26. You see, the Lord knows how fickle his people are, switching their loyalty between him and the Ashtoreth and Baal all the time. And now Abimelech realizes how fickle the people are because they switch their loyalty from him. They've got Teflon loyalty. Doesn't stick for very long with anyone. But again, when I read this, and I hope it's the same for you guys as well, when you read these passages and you think, why, 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 why will these people not just remain faithful to the Lord? Why do they do that? Why do they make that choice? But I hope it opens up your heart and say, but what am I like? What do I do? What is my loyalty like? Is my loyalty for the Lord just like Teflon? It doesn't stick. Um, for very um, long. And so trouble starts brewing in Shechem, plotting, scheming. Abimelech, Abimelech, driven by personal revenge and his own reputation, consumes the city of Shechem in a tower. 
and then consumed, and then he's consumed as he meets the lady who has a real crush on him at the Tower of Thebes. So Jotham's curse from the mountain comes to pass, doesn't it? Shechem, the place that was really supposed to set the spiritual temperature of Israel, the place where Abraham worshipped the Lord, where Joshua and the people worshipped the Lord together. It was a city of refuge where people could come and find safety. And Shechem, this wonderful religious place that's supposed to set the spiritual temperature of Israel, ends up barren, salt scattered over it, so that its fields cannot grow any crops. What's happened? The thorn bush king has choked the life out of the plants of Israel. Wrong choice, wrong person that they followed, and suddenly there's no life left in Shechem. Nothing can grow in the fields. The people have been killed in a tower. And that's the thing you see, bramble kings always burn the people. You see, we should always vote wisely uh, as the general election comes up. We should always think um, who might be the best um, people, um, who might promote justice, peace, um, religious freedom, who might best um, serve uh, in a way that the truth of God's um, word could be upheld. Um, but the reality is, that no ruler other than the Lord will ever rule in the right way. And if we exalt them and we make them king over us, they'll eventually burn us. Because thornbush kings cannot provide what the people need. And everything has been distorted. Shechem, far from being a city of refuge for unjust killings, has become a city where it plots um, murders people. Instead of being a center of covenant and faithfulness to the Lord, Shechem uses money from Baal of the covenant, and that's the translation, to fund Abimelech. Just think about that. This place that's supposed to show faithfulness to God, the Lord of the covenant, um, suddenly um, comes, gets money from a false god in order to pay for Abimelech um, to become king. And you think, well, that would never happen now, would it, in the church? The church would never take money from all sorts of causes by all sorts of dubious means in order to make its pastors and ministers millionaires, fly in private jets, living in um, multi-million pound um, houses, he says, it's all too easy for the people of God and to fall into this place where we'll use our resources to promote and further someone who is far from a ruler that God would want and a minister that God would want to be leading the church. And Jotham stands on Mount Gerizim that's supposed to be the Mount of Blessing, but he utters a curse. Everything has been Perverted. But here's the final thing. As the people make their offer of kingship, as kingship is rejected by one and craved by another, the one who is completely the right choice has always stood before them. You see, the narrative gives the impression, and I guess when we were reading chapter 8 and 9 together, it gives the impression that bloodthirsty men are winning the day, doesn't it? It could easily be made into a film where it just seems like bloodthirsty men are winning the day. They're holding sway over everyone. But we discover by the end in the narrative that it's actually the blood-honoring Lord. He's ruling the day. You see, on first observation, the smoke that rises out of these incidents doesn't smell like the fire of God's judgment. But it is. But sometimes God's judgment is like that. It's silent, unobserved, often God using evil men to judge evil men. And did you notice how everyone's evil is turned back on them? Shechem ambushes and is ambushed. Abimelech's plot becomes Gaal's plot. Abimelech's fate is particularly poetic, isn't it? 
The man who killed his brothers on one stone meets his end because of one stone. And all the way through the narrative, all these little hints are there that bloodthirsty men are not ruling the day, but the blood honoring God is ruling the day. And he will make sure that justice is done, that people are brought to account, that the punishment does um, fit um, the crime. The Lord rules with full justice. Wickedness will not go unpunished. You see, we need to know that, don't we? We need to know that as God's um, people in a world with so many injustices, in a world where bloodthirsty people seem to at times have the upper hand. But to know that that won't be the end of the day because God will always bring about his justice and the punishment will fit the crime. So what kind of leader are we looking for? I guess we don't want a king like Gideon who consolidates his position at the expense of his people, do we? I guess we don't want a king who craves after status and tramples on his own people in order to get it like Abimelech. What kind of king would we like? What kind of king is judges yearning after? What kind of king is judges saying, look, if only there was one like this, rather than like this, if we only we could have somebody who was the opposite, if only we could have a king who, it could be said of him that he came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Or if, what if we could find a king who it could be said of it, him that being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, who would use his position to serve the people. What if we could find a king who rather than being a thorn bush to the people would take a crown of thorns for the people that he would endure the suffering so that they might have life. And surely if we could find a king like that, who will serve the people, use his exalted position for the people, endure the thorns for the people, then that would be a king worth following, a servant king, a humble king, a sacrificial king, because that kind of king would indeed bring blessing to the people the oil, the wine, the fruit, the gladness. Yes, Judges is getting us ready and gets us to yearn for a better king. So when you cast your um, vote on the elections, do so wisely, do it with a Christian mindset, but do it knowing that it's chew as your poison. <laughs> Until the Lord um, himself um, returns, Nobody will rule with utter, absolute justice and goodness and bring benefit and fruit and gladness to the people. They'll all pursue their own ends because if we put ourselves in those positions of power, so would we. And that's why, ultimately, power belongs to the Lord. He's the one who's exalted and he's the one who's king over all. Let's pray. Lord, you um, have given um, to nations, rulers, and governors with specific tasks, Lord, and to administer justice, to seek the good of the people, and to promote peace. And, but we recognize, Lord, that if we demand too much of these people, if we exalt them over us and put our hope and trust in them, they will only ever um, disappoint because they cannot bear um, that weight. You know, the book of Judges and the experience of the people of Israel and our experience under different governments and rulers is a longing and a yearning for your perfect government a longing and yearning for your return where justice 
righteousness, peace, and holiness will be across the whole world and where we will all be subject to you in perfect loyalty, absolute faithfulness, undiluted and devoted worship of you, our great King of kings and Lord of laws. Lord, cause our hearts to yearn after you and for us to be people who serve you, people not looking for status, not looking for security, but to be willing to answer your call wherever that would take us, wherever claim you would put upon, upon our lives because we trust in you, the good king, the perfect king, the one who took the thorns so that we might have life. Amen.